Hello, and welcome to the Argyle Talent Acquisition Summit, Hire, Retain, Engage. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, then we'll turn the floor over to our opening keynote speaker. First, we welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. Also be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I'd like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Let's get started. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Angela Bennett, who is former Senior Vice President for Talent Acquisition and Talent Management at L'Oreal USA. We are excited to have Angela for her opening keynote presentation called Combat Quiet Quitting with Internal Coaching. Welcome, Angela. Over to you. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about quiet quitting, which we have all heard quite a lot of in the media lately. Uh, we'll go through how did we get here? Uh, we'll go through coaching and how coaching can serve as an ultimate customized support for employees, especially when it comes to engagement and retention, building a case for internal coaching, overcoming skepticism, and getting started with an impactful internal program. So a little bit about me before we get started. So I spent uh, 20 years at L'Oreal, most recently as the head of talent. I spent my career starting actually at the Estee Lauder companies, working for brands like Clinique, Maybelline, Garnier, La Roche-Posay, marketing in the beauty industry, in general management sales, and then finally HR roles in the talent world. Um, I then set my eyes on coaching uh, through my HR role. I discovered that and the help and support it can bring to employees. And I am now supporting others and navigating meaningful careers as an executive coach. Getting into today's topic a little bit, how did we get here? Well, the term quiet quitting, you probably have all heard at this point. You may or may not know that it's not entirely new. It was first used in 2009 by an economist uh, at Texas A&M uh, talking about the diminishing ambitions in Venezuela. Fast forward to 2022, why is there so much talk about it? A couple of things. Well, this guy here started to make some videos about the topic and it resonated. What does that tell us? Well, first of all, what is quiet quitting? Quiet quitting is really not so much about quitting your actual job, but more so setting boundaries, quitting going above and beyond, quitting the hustle culture, if you will, embracing the whole concept that work isn't your entire life. In Back in the day, uh, this concept is, is not entirely new. We used to call it coasting. We used to call it checking out. Um, but today there's something happening uh, where it's receiving more and more attention. Of course, it's very media buzzworthy, but what's really behind it? And as organizations, what can we do to combat it? It is a phenomenon that Gallup has recently estimated is affecting uh, nearly half of people, which uh, if it has been around for some time, this is a startling statistic that perhaps it's around in a more prominent way. How do we potentially get there? Well, I have some theories of my own. I started work in the 90s and back in that day, this is what my desk looked like. I had a computer that was one of those box square screens with a console that literally was chained to my desk. There was no way to take that with me. Uh, you may have, if you're from a similar generation had one of these, an actual telephone with voicemail that was used. Fast forward to the 2000s, I received my first laptop. It was the IBM ThinkPad. It probably weighed like 15 pounds, so it wasn't 
all that comfortable to carry around, but uh, you didn't pretty, you didn't really take it home as much as you took it uh, on an airplane to present at retailers. And then the magical Blackberry came and there's me with my Blackberry actually with a sad face because that was the day that the Blackberry was going away and we were all getting iPhones. I had become one of the fastest typers uh, ever on the Blackberry. And uh, that was one of my uh, claims to fame that I was actually very proud of. <laughs> uh, fast forward to today, um, look at the many ways that, that we communicate through work from your phone buzzing with text, sometimes two phones, a personal and a work phone, uh, people reaching you on IM, you've got virtual meetings going on, you got in-person meetings, there's a never ending amount of emails in the box. And so no wonder we've gone to a place where you can work anytime, anywhere, across multiple time zones, but at what cost? So combat, quiet quitting is really helping us see that there's a shift in cultural attitudes towards work. And what's really interesting and stark to me as I look around the large organizations and, and coach others in large organizations is that there's really this, this tension created between the generation that lived through this and had to do what they had to do and work anytime and anywhere. And that's how they now moved into the leadership positions that they're in today. And the new generation who is basically saying, I don't want to work that way. In a recent Randstad staffing survey, uh, they, they researched millennials and found that nearly half would rather quit their job um, than be unhappy at work. So we're definitely seeing these, these shifts in cultural attitudes and this tension between the, the leaders that are in there now and the fact that they always had to work anytime, anywhere. There was no work from home and the new generation who's really, you know, standing up and saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to work that way. Uh, certainly COVID has uh, been uh, part of the, the change. It, it really was a, a reset. There was a great resignation. The labor market is still tighter. There are still less people in the labor market than pre-COVID. Um, many, many different sources have reported in on a productivity drop and most recently then an engagement decline because those that are left sometimes um, when others have left the organization now have higher workload and are now the ones that are carrying even more uh, leading to kind of this lack of engagement. And this is something that many large organizations are now facing. The repercussions are really this stress, burnout, demotivation, little to no feeling of work-life balance. Um, employees lacking, you know, a moment of self-care and, and well-being, uh, organizations starting to create, you know, chief wellness officers. Um, we've seen a lack of, of purpose and meaning in work and the younger generations really desiring as a, a point of entry that there, there be meaningful work and that they're finding that purpose. Um, I've also seen a disconnect between uh, the natural strengths of someone and the requirements of role that often is coming into play. All of these types of um, challenges uh, can be addressed with uh, coaching support. And coaching can really be a very custom um, way of addressing what's going on behind the quiet quit. A moment on coaching, coaching has really seen a shift. So there used to really be like a focus on the old model, which is take, you're taking a, a senior leadership role, uh, you're facing challenges, new complexities, uh, you're offered a coach. Um, that's what happened to me when I was growing through the organization. But today the model is about ongoing investment in the people. It could be stress burnout, um, 
uh, tactics and, and creating any kind of action to move forward, uh, to help assess a situation um, and design some action plan for moving forward. And that again, can be a new position, a new team, career planning, uh, transitional times in an employee's life. And there's many facets that coaching can really get into. Coaching is trending. The awareness of professional coaching in 2010 was only about 51%. And in the recent survey uh, data that recapped 2021, it had gone up to 70%. 67% have now either participated or interested in participating in coaching. And it's particularly interesting to um, Gen Z and millennial populations where 70% are interested in what coaching support can offer them. Uh, a lot of this stemming from the customized aspect of it. So building an internal um, case. Well, step one is really assessing qualitatively and quantitatively what are the needs. So what's behind that quiet quit? Um, it can shift mindset, it can motivate, it can create uh, new action plans and, and really be an invigorating process to partner with someone and design a personal action plan to address any of the types of things here uh, that you see. Um, some of the things that I've personally seen as a manager of many, many people um, and in my talent roles and in those that I coach is uh, certainly stress and burnout um, workload, you know, not seeing an end uh, to ongoing workload challenges or any, any action steps coming in, um, purpose for sure, playing a role. Uh, sometimes it's just about, you know, how do you derive purpose out of the role that you're in and make even greater impact uh, to want to go above and beyond in a special project and bring um, even more meaning into your role. So quantitatively, um, there's ways to, to measure. Uh, some large organizations have adopted uh, an ongoing, you know, uh, getting your finger on the pulse of what's going on with the employee uh, survey feedback. Uh, these are just examples. I don't in endorse or work for these companies, but that can typically be done either through consulting firms. Corn Ferry, for example, has um, a, a a program where they're really measuring enablement and engagement. And you can look at the trends of who is feeling uh, highly engaged and highly enabled and who might be feeling, you know, not very engaged and not very enabled. Um, and therefore, in the least effective quadrant, there's others that are, are feeling engaged, but they're not enabled. They're in a frustrated quadrant and, and kind of watching and tracking that um, over time periods can uncover some of the root uh, causes of uh, a sentiment that might lead to quiet quitting. There's also platforms like Quantum Workplace where uh, you have the flexibility to kind of be able to define your own survey uh, based on relevant needs. Second, present some market statistics. If you find that it's stress that is uh, coming to the top, uh, or purpose or engagement. There's many sources that you can go out there and say, you know, if we address stress, if we address purpose, or we address engagement, look at the great results that can come and are proven to come in various quantitative uh, sources that you can research online. That always gives a little bit more uh, meat to the rationale of, of what results can be expected if you hone in and dig into and start to address one of these particular areas or multiple of the areas through an internal coaching program. Uh, third is really educating on, on coaching. Still, there isn't a, a broad understanding across all levels of the organization and managers of what coaching really is and how, uh, it, is, how it can help. Um, as defined by the International Coaching Federation, which is 
the largest global organization supporting coaching, it's partnering together in a thought provoking and creative process that inspires people to maximize their potential personally and professionally. It helps individuals assess their situation, solve problems, take action forward, and therefore it can really be um, a customized support that can dig into why someone might be quiet quitting. What's behind that behavior? Uh, is it that they don't see a path for themselves in this organization? So how do they navigate career pathing and set themselves an action plan for networking, creating their own personal story, evaluating their strengths and what they have to offer and the impact they want to make in the organization and getting real, real clear around that to help them feel that they are in the driver's seat of their career. Um, perhaps it's about uh, burnout and, and, and workload, uh, how to develop strategies. Coaching can help develop strategies on addressing that uh, prioritization of work. Um, can dig into work-life balance and how to create an action plan on that. Um, then it's important, of course, to calculate the ROI. And um, that can be done easily in putting together some facts and figures on the cost avoidance of losing someone. What does it cost uh, from either the agency or your internal talent acquisition team every time uh, we have to hire someone as an organization? What are the sunk costs of having trained and onboarded someone to begin with? Or how much has been invested in that person annually? What is the cost, uh, especially in a tight labor market, of literally replacing someone at market value? What's the the lost productivity or negative effects on other employees when someone leaves and that workload needs to be redistributed. So putting your ROI together with your quantitative stats and together with some of your marketplace data that can uh, show the results and outcomes that can be expected from honing in on an idea. Um, so how do we overcome skepticism? So really, a good, great way to do that is uh, the proof is in the pudding. Start a pilot program. Choose one particular area. There's so many areas to dig into, but where are you looking to move the needle? And test pilot. Maybe it's just one brand over here or one group over there. Uh, put metrics behind that. There's a number of ways that you can measure. Um, it can be from an ongoing uh, finger on the pulse survey. It can be a before and after custom survey that you uh, put into place. And that is always a great idea so that you can show the change that has occurred. Um, establishing a sponsor. So that can be really important, a business leader sponsor in particular, who can attest to having seen the benefits uh, every day and working with the employee population that the coaching has provided and always recommended to do um, a post-coaching survey with those who have gone through the program. If you're interested at all, I have some recommendations and a one-sheeter on what that what those types of metrics uh, could be in order to gain some uh, quantitative facts again on those who have gone through coaching. All right, so getting started, there, there's a couple different ways you can get started. So um, no additional budget at this time, not necessarily a problem. Uh, in almost any organization I've seen, you have your, your coaching passionates. Um, that was me for sure, and there's many other people in the organizations that I've been in, uh, typically in HR, who have become certified professional coaches in order to uh, bring that coaching posture into their HR role every day, but they're not um, functioning as a, a coach on an ongoing basis, but would love to exercise um, the skills that they learned by becoming a certified professional coach. Um, oftentimes, uh, I get the question about conflict of interest. 
um, you, I, it's a recommendation to not necessarily coach anyone in your direct HR population, but to cross pollinate. So for example, if there is a certified professional coach in your HR population over in your operations area, the operations uh, HR uh, coach can manage uh, coaching for the finance population and vice versa. Or if your organization has different divisions, uh, you can do cross divisional and it's a way to get started. You can have one coach who's really passionate be a, kind of the cohort leader to bring the different coaches together and create your own internal program. If you got budget, there's agencies. There's uh, plenty of agencies that can support, customize support uh, for coaching and uh, be able to scale for your, your whole organization. Typically you wanna do a request for proposal for at least three agencies to determine costs and fit. And then there's customized coaching uh, coaches that are available. So that's what I do. I, I specialize in um, executive coaching and fast paced uh, um, organizations, but also in career coaching and communication coaching. For many of my people throughout my career, I hired specific communication coaches um, that specialize in just that. There's there's other coaches that just do career coaching, and that for sure is um, a way to get started as well, especially if you're looking to hone in on a very specific area. Um, lastly, um, you know, aligning the stakeholders on how coaching fits into the total talent development uh, plan. And, and really seeing it and helping the organization see it as um, being able to increase enablement, engagement of employees, and ultimately the end goal of retention. If they're having the conversation with you, feeling supported by the organization, and then perhaps they're less likely to want to check out. But it is coaching is part of a robust plan. You've got your learning for development. Uh, upskilling coaching can really be complementary to that, um, but it must be coupled, in my opinion, with the transparency and career moves. Ultimately, the question for those who are quiet quitting is, what's in it for me? What am I working towards? And, and is there value and worth in that? Um, so, Here's, uh, I hope this was beneficial. We have a few time, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, here are some ways that you can get in touch if this topic is interesting to you. If you are interested in more information about anything that I spoke about today, very happy to connect with you. Thank you so much. Let's head over for some questions. Thanks, Angela, for your presentation. Just as a reminder, audience members can still enter questions, and we're going to review some of the questions that have come in so far. The first question is, what's the biggest mistake you've seen companies make in implementing an internal coaching program? Yeah, I would say that really not explaining thoroughly enough what coaching is and shifting the mindset between the old model, which is that coaching comes into play maybe when there's a challenge uh, from a leadership perspective that the employee is facing. So there can sometimes be this negative perception that, oh, I need a coach, like what's wrong with me? And so it's really, you know, especially as a member of the International Coaching Federation, like They've done so much work and their, their, their mantra is empowering the world through coaching. So shifting the mindset of how coaching can really support employees and that it is not a remedial thing, but it's an investment and a customized support just for you that can really um, shift the mindset 
uh, into adoption of coaching. And, and once people go through coaching and really understand what it is, but in my experience, we're, we're still a little bit at the infancy. You've seen the numbers and how much they've grown in terms of awareness of professional coaching, but truly a real understanding of what coaching can offer is not widespread yet in most of the organizations I've seen from managers through the employee level. Great, thank you. The next question is, how do you see the discipline of internal coaching evolving over the next couple of years? Yeah, I definitely see it evolving to a place where it's more scaled uh, and more customized. So again, with that kind of old model, uh, the old model is also very expensive. So the investment in coaching support for one senior level person was quite an investment, typically $20,000 or more per person. But today with the growth of uh, coaching and just the, the number of coaches available, the number of agencies that are offering support and the pricing, um, there are a variety of different ways to get started. And it doesn't always have to be $20,000 or more per person person, there are coaches that have an hourly rate that makes it um, more uh, scalable. Um, and again, I think it comes down to whether companies are going to go all in uh, and actually advertise the coaching support to employees, um, or will it remain um, in HR, you know, recommended um, program um, based on the needs that they see for their employee population. And I, I see they're uh, subtly starting to be a shift where um, it goes towards employee awareness and offering it as um, just a, a repertoire of benefits that are also available through your organization. Great, thank you. The next question is, we are struggling to retain people, even with improvements in our compensation packages. Do you have any advice for us? Yeah, um, there's so many aspects to it. And again, that's where I lean back on the quantitative data uh, and ongoing pulse checks on that quantitative data. That quantitative data coupled with um, qualitative data which is literally having managers or HR professionals sit with the people and try to understand just as we, we understand consumer behavior through focus groups, the focus group of your organization and your employee population to start to uncover what are the root causes. So there's another quiet quitting, in my opinion, which I, I call more so the, uh, the surprise quit, if you will, um, which is that you think the employee's fine, they're telling you that they're happy and that this role is great, and then all of a sudden they quietly quit on you. <laughs> I mean, different than, than the definition in the media, but it's the surprise resignation where all of a sudden you, you, you thought this person was fine and, and, and they weren't, you know? So the more you can get your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the organization quantitatively, you can create some customized learning programs um, or coaching that can address those. But there, there's a myriad of issues and, and why I became so interested in coaching is because there are so many different unique aspects to every human's challenges. Um, and that's where a customized uh, co coaching can come into play. But there's certainly a lot of other areas that can be addressed with learning for development programs if you have that data on where some of the unsatisfactions, you know, what's being, what's left unsaid, the, those are the key questions to try to get down to it. And can you put small groups of people together to dissect the quantitative data to give you more insights? And often they are in the verbatim. So who's data mining the verbatims that are coming through any of these surveys to really dig and get into some of the root challenges employees are facing and, 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 um, feel that are not being addressed. Great, thank you. Let's take the time for one last question, and that is, what type of coaching certification program would you recommend? 
Yeah, so the International Coaching Federation is uh, one of the largest governing bodies, if you will, of coaching. They set ethical uh, standards and uh, standards for core competencies for all coaches to um, abide by. And um, they also have their own credentialing process. So after coaching for so many hours, um, there is a submission of a coaching recording for assessment. There is an actual knowledge exam. And uh, if a coach goes through all of that, which I have done, you are then also uh, an ICF, International Coaching Federation certified coach. Most large organizations that I've worked with are looking for that additional certification, uh, which creates a, a bit of... Um, you know, standardization around the, the coaching practice and ensures, you know, really that all the coaches have, uh, are abiding by ethical standards. And, and if they don't, there, there's a system for, for reporting that and, and, uh, removing the credentialing. So, um, that my recommendation is to look for that additional international coaching federation certification. Thank you again, Angela, for this excellent keynote. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thanks again.